Therapy Chat Podcast, episode 389. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. This week's episode is sponsored by Therapy Notes, the number one rated electronic health record system available today. With live telephone support seven days a week, it's clear why Therapy Notes is rated 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot and has a 5-star rating on Google. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. And now, for all you prescribers out there, Therapy Notes is proudly introducing ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and I have to tell you that I'm super excited because Therapy Chat is coming up on its eighth birthday next month, and we are just coming up to 7 million downloads, almost a million a year. Obviously, the first year we weren't getting anywhere near a million per year, but I'm very grateful for everyone who listens, everyone who's ever listened. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting. I've started to think about recently being the youngest child in my family and how the youngest, and maybe this is just in my family, but it's like the youngest is always wanting to be heard. (laughs) So anyone can make a podcast. And I finally found a way to have a platform to be able to talk about whatever I want to talk about as much as I want. (laughs) So if you want to be heard, remember, you can always start a podcast (laughs) and sometimes millions of people will end up listening, which is a bit of an unexpected benefit in this whole process. But I had a lot I wanted to say, and I still do have a lot that I want to say, and I'm grateful to all of you who have listened over the years. And if you're a first time listener, I'm grateful for you today as well. So if you are listening for the first time, then you haven't heard that I recently had a death in the family and it's brought up all kinds of complicated family dynamics as grief does. I am understanding how closely intertwined grief and trauma are in a new way. Thanks, especially to Linda Tai and what she's taught me both by me taking her certificate course, but also just if you listen to the podcast, she's been my guest a few times recently, and she's showing me somatically how much grief I'm holding in my body and how much it brings up trauma. You know, I knew that, but now I really know it in a different way, an embodied way. And that's one of the things that I talk about here a lot on the show is about embodying the work and the healing journey. We therapists can be up in our heads, really intellectually stimulated and intelligent and, you know, oh, I see exactly what's going on here. But when we are embodying it, I think the way we show up with our clients is a lot different. So that is something that I've talked about with a lot of therapists. We were talking about it today in our Trauma Therapist Network community. So this week's episode is very timely considering what has been happening for me and for so many of us. I feel that we are in a time where there was a huge collective trauma that turned everything upside down in 2020 and additional layers of trauma were unearthed during that process. And now Three years later, many people are having the post-traumatic response. So it's kind of interesting to have a, a worldwide collective traumatic experience, even though it wasn't experienced by everyone in the same way, and then to have a worldwide post-traumatic reaction. Makes sense, though. I mean, no one is immune from having a trauma reaction following a trauma, an experience that's traumatic. We might not all have 
our reactions at the same time or in the same way, but it's a human reaction. It's a, it's a biological experience to have these things show up after the experience, which is why we call it post-traumatic stress disorder. So this week is a replay episode. I have been working very hard over the past months through in the midst of this complex trauma and grief experience that's happening within my family in multiple ways. So this week I'm giving you this replay episode to give myself a little bit more space to prepare all the exciting things that I have coming up for you later in the year. And I am really, really excited about the new ideas I have for a series of conversations to go a lot deeper into some topics that we've touched on briefly. So I'll share more about that later. But for today, the reason why this episode is so timely is really for two reasons. One is my guest, Dr. Lindsay Gibson, who is the author of several books. And her most recent book up until this year has been Self-Care for Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. And Lindsay teaches about basically the development of the self through the perspective of developmental psychology and so much of what causes us pain in childhood is related to unmet needs emotionally, physically, that children experience because their parents also didn't get those needs met. And it makes sense because historically people didn't even know that children had these developmental needs until more recently. And in recent generations, many parents have had a better understanding of this and have been trying to do things differently. But so many of us are impacted by unmet childhood needs, attachment needs that our parents didn't know we had and they didn't know how to give us. And Lindsay has a new book coming out very soon. And I'm planning to interview her about that new book. It's called Disentangling from emotionally immature people. I loved this conversation that we had originally in early 2022, where she teaches how we develop our sense of self and how it can be interrupted. And I love that she teaches about this from a very compassionate perspective. And it's not about blaming and calling people narcissistic or borderline. Those Descriptions do have some value to offer in understanding behaviors and to understand how, you know, someone else's behavior is not your fault. And at the same time, I think that those those labels are extremely limiting because they don't account for the humanity of the person that's being described. And I like the way Lindsay teaches about identity formation and developmental psychology to help create a more compassionate view of the way people parent and the way we feel when we weren't parented the way we needed to be. So let's get into it. I'll tell you real quick a little bit about Lindsay. Lindsay C. Gibson, Psy D, holds both a master's and doctoral degree in clinical psychology. She's been a psychotherapist for over 30 years, working in diverse settings such as the juvenile court system, community mental health, psychiatric hospitals, group practice, and solo practice. During her career in psychological testing, she did literally thousands of evaluations of children and adults, and she was able to understand people in this testing through a developmental perspective, which has led her to becoming a gifted teacher and public speaker who offers trainings on multiple topics to other mental health professionals, and has she has done so throughout her career. And she's served as an adjunct assistant professor for the Virginia Consortium Program for Clinical Psychology. Shout out to my friend Courtney, who went through that program, leading doctoral student workshops and independent study classes. Lindsay is the author of now five books. Her past books are called Who You Were Meant to Be, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, Recovering from Emotionally Immature Parents, and Self-Care for Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. And like I said, her new book is called Disentangling from Emotionally Immature People, I believe. 
Yeah, people. I've got it right there. Avoid emotional traps, stand up for yourself, and transform your relationships as an adult child of emotionally immature parents. So basically, it's about understanding the dynamics that come from these relationships and how to effectively communicate and set boundaries within these relational patterns. And hopefully she'll be on the show soon and she can talk much more about the book and about strategies that people can use. Because when you're in a crisis situation, people do kind of revert to their old ways of functioning and their old coping strategies and patterns if they don't have anything else more updated to use. And it can be very confusing when people who you once felt you trusted and felt close with suddenly are behaving in a way that seems alien to you and you don't know how to react. And it just, it can really throw your nervous system off and cause you to have trauma reaction. And another thing that I love about Lindsay Gibson is that she lives in the place where I grew up, Virginia Beach, Virginia. I grew up in Norfolk, but they're right next to each other. So when I speak with her, I hear her Tidewater accent and it feels very much like home. So we'll get right into it. I hope you will enjoy this conversation and looking forward to bringing another conversation with Lindsay to you soon. In the meantime, be well. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I'm so excited to be talking with Dr. Lindsay Gibson, who is the author of several books, including her newest book, Self-Care for Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. And I am so excited to dive into this. Lindsay, thank you for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. I'll tell our audience that Allison Deneen, who was on a, a few weeks or a couple months back now, by the time this airs, was begging me to have you as my guest. So I'm so excited that it worked out. So I really want to get into this fascinating topic. But before we start, will you just tell our audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm a clinical psychologist. I've been in, in practice for over 35 years now. And I started out as a psychological tester. Um, I did a lot of psychological evaluations. And when I was in that capacity, I did a lot of looking at what developmental level people were showing in their psychological evaluation. Because usually when therapists are referring someone for testing, they're doing it because they, they want to understand what they're dealing with in therapy. And so I, you know, might address symptoms, I might address diagnosis, but what was really useful to them was to say, you know, intellectually, this person is functioning above average, but emotionally, this person is functioning like a five-year-old or a 12-year-old or, you know, 15-year-old, because that really gave them a fix on what they were dealing with in their interactions with them. So I started out in my training with that mindset, and then I went back to school and got my doctorate and then became uh, a psych more of a psychotherapist at that point. So I got interested in this area because when people were talking to me about their families, or I mean, it could be your partner, it could be your boss, um, it could be your friend, they would be describing their behaviors. And I'm thinking, whoa, why is this person in my office and not the people that they're describing that they're involved with? Um, so true. You know? And I thought, what a rotten deal that this, this, you know, introspective, sensitive, kind person is in my office trying to learn how to get along with these impulsive, reactive people who are pretty much running wild. <laughs> and and not thinking about how they're affecting other people. And it just seemed like, you know, kind of upside down to me. Mm -hmm. What I began to do was I began to share with Sam what I was seeing about their strengths and about their maturity and about, you know, how they approach life. And then I would compare it to the emotionally immature approach of these other people in their life and what that mix felt like to them and the problems that it caused them. And they found it really helpful. 
So a lot of it I started out with was, you know, basic psychoeducation that, you know, people can develop in these different, different lines of development, different strands of development. Like someone could be very bright intellectually. Okay. Even like I said before, above the norm, they could be extremely socially skilled. I mean, put them in a cocktail party or in a board meeting and, you know, they run with it. They are superb at that. Have them run a business, have them get to be PTA president. I mean, these are very, very functional lines of development. But in their emotional development, you could see the immaturity because they would have trouble with empathy. They would have trouble with emotional intimacy with people in their lives. And they would be very emotionally reactive. So when you, when you saw those kinds of characteristics, you realized that this person had kind of stopped back there Usually it's at a pretty young age, like around, you know, around that two to five year old period, which is where a lot of personality development happens. And so, you know, by helping people understand what they were looking at and what they were dealing with, and then comparably, uh, really how able they were to be more mature, it was, it was very comforting to them. And it also empowered them to look at these other people in a way that they could really deal with them effectively, as opposed to, you know, be confused all the time about the contradictory behavior, you know, the the way that they hurt other people, the lack of self-reflection. They were able to, you know, begin to put that in a context that they could understand. And that's very empowering to people. Yeah, that's so interesting. And really compassionate too, because you're talking about people dealing with other people who are emotionally immature. You know, we often see in therapy people whose parents were not what they needed. They didn't do, they didn't meet their needs in every way that they needed them to. I mean, Mm -hmm. so in other words, the parents were human, but also if the parents experience, you know, not having their needs met or abuse and, and losses and things like that, or having to grow up too soon and like things that our parents and grandparents had to go and to work when they were 10 and stuff like that. It's not that the parents didn't want to take care of their kids and try to do a good job. It's that they didn't have the skills, the emotional development to be able to do it. So consequently, the kids, you know, their kids have those maybe deficits as well. They may have certain areas really um, well-developed and others are sort of stuck in certain times when things went wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I like that, you know, I like that way of looking at it better than, for example, it's never resonated for me when people say, oh, your parents a narcissist, you know, it's like, well, I mean, of course people can be very abusive and I can understand, but oftentimes like this preoccupied parent could be seen that way because they're just, you know, they're depressed or they're dealing with their own trauma or whatever. So I like a compassionate approach because, you know, it's more, there's more space there for healing. Yeah. And, you know, nobody likes to call their parent a name. Right. Um, And that's what diagnosis is. It's, It's boiling down the entire personality to one set of defensive symptoms, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that people know that their parents aren't behaving narcissistically or borderline or, you know, whatever. They aren't doing that 100% of the time. Right. It's more like the parent is like a layer cake. You know, sometimes they get icing and sometimes they get cake (laughs) and sometimes they get something else. But it, it, they're not, you know, they're not a homogenized entity. That's one of the problems with emotional immaturity is that the self-development has not proceeded to a place where that person is truly integrated and whole inside with good self-development. Instead, their, their personality developed in kind of in little pieces that kind of stay separate inside, if we can conceptualize it that way. Yeah, And that means that the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So the, the parent may blow up and then, you know, half an hour later, they're okay, you know, or something has happened to make them feel better. And now they're, they flipped and now they're fine. 
but it's it's like this um, stock market graph. You don't know what you're going to get because you you never know which part of the parent is going to be in ascendance. It's all depending on whether that parent feels threatened or anxious. You know, anything that triggers defensive behavior and they go into a part of their personality and then it's, you know, no old guard. Yes. <laughs> you know, they don't stop at anything in order to get themselves feeling back in control and safe and empowered again. And that's going to be pretty hard on a kid when the parent is, you know, kind of fighting for their life like that, psychologically speaking. Mm-hmm. What a beautiful description. This is, I love this already. I love talking about this. Yeah. Yeah. It's so helpful to understand it that way because one of the hallmark features along with emotional loneliness for an adult child of an emotionally immature parent is confusion. Uh, They experience what, what one person said, she called it brain scramble, meaning that When you're around them and you're kind of following their reactivity, it becomes very confusing because one minute they're saying this and another minute they're saying that. And then the next minute they're denying they ever said the other thing. And it becomes very, very confusing. So if you can explain to them that it's not that, and that's what makes people feel crazy. Yes. And makes them doubt themselves and say, well, wait a minute, maybe, you know, maybe I have it all wrong. That's because they're self-reflective. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when your strength, you know, works against you, as you're thinking, maybe I have a part in this, maybe I didn't hear that right. But you probably did hear it right. But for them, it doesn't coalesce into something where they go, well, I can't have A and B at the same time. So let me put those together and see what I think the, you know, see what see what C is. They don't do that. They feel comfortable with that contradictory inner construction that allows them to be one way one minute and one way the other. So I, I like explaining it that way because otherwise a lot of what uh, emotionally mature people do doesn't make sense. Yes. It, and it's, uh, you know, ill, it can be illogical. But when you try to follow what they're saying, I mean, I wish that we could have like automatic transcripts, mm. you know, that just, I don't know, like a ticker tape, you know, that just comes out and you get to look at it later and you would see how they jump and how they're moving. Mm. From one personality part to another to another, but all of it is geared toward keeping them safe and keeping you in a subordinate position because that is how they feel safe. By having all the power and not letting you have. Yeah, because they're scared to death. I mean, remember, these are like little kids Mm. inside grown up clothes. You know, if you imagine like the little boy in his daddy's suit or the little girl in her mommy's high heels, you know, they're off balance and uncomfortable because they're having to function without a fully integrated self. And so they're easily threatened and they are, they easily get reactive because of that. Yes. I mean, I'm really, you can, we're seeing each other and you're probably seeing like the wheels spinning in my mind. I'm like, "Mm." because I'm not a psychologist. So my way of conceptualizing this is just it's, I see what you're saying and I don't have the training in like the self in the same way that, you know, psychology tends to do. And I love, I'm just like, Ooh, oh man, I gotta read this. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's so, it's, it's actually very practical, I think, because yeah. we all know what it feels like when we are in ourselves, you know, when you feel together, when you feel calm, when you feel authentic, you know, there's a very Uh distinct experience when you're in your true self. And when you're, when you don't have good self-development, you know, those people feel off balance all the time and their defensive behavior makes it, they're trying to get their balance back, usually through some kind of interaction with another person. Like they depend on other people to help them with their emotional stability. And they depend on other people to help them with their self-esteem. This this has not been internalized to a degree where I'm able to keep myself pretty stable and I'm able to keep my self-esteem pretty good. That's not something that they do by themselves very well. So they will recruit uh, the people around them to stabilize them, emotionally regulate them and make them feel good about themselves. But 
that is your child who's having to perform those functions, that's really hard on that child because they're essentially asking the child to function as an adult, as a fully formed adult without their own needs in order to keep mom or dad calm and functioning as an adult. And it gets skewed toward let's meet the needs of the parent as opposed to let's help this child discover themselves and grow up strong inside. Yeah. Oh, it's, you're describing it so beautifully and it's so painful to think about at the same time, you know? Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, yeah, some elements of it are tragic. Mm -hmm. But I know that many people who are listening are going to be thinking, wow, okay, that explains so much because I think, like you said, that confusion of trying to follow, well, how did this happen? Why is this person suddenly erupting when they were smiling and calm five minutes ago or 30 seconds ago? And, you know, did I do something? What are they reacting to? And when it's your parent who you depend on for your own safety, I mean, children can't, you know, they can't buy things, they can't drive, they can't, you know, cook. And so many other things, of course, the emotional needs they they are relying on their parent for. And if their role is to fill the parents' emotional needs, theirs just get, you know, they're not on the list. Right, right. And then as they grow up, it's very hard for them to engage in good self-care at at an emotional level because they've kind of been trained to believe that their goodness, their worth, their lovability comes from their ability to sense the needs of other people and put them first. So there's this weird moral component to it as well, which I think is very destructive, where the parent acts like the child is bad for not thinking of that parent first, which is, you know, a stretch for any normal child to, you know, to put themselves in somebody else's shoes. I mean, you know, in some ways, this is like a a premature maturity that they have to go into. So what happens is they become prematurely sensitive to other people, to reading situations, to, you know, worrying about how something is going to affect somebody in the family or being very careful about self-monitoring, self-editing, self-censoring, because they know how that's going to affect the parent. Mm -hmm. And so instead of thinking to themselves, you know, in in self-care terms, um, like I need to rest or uh, this is too much for me or I need to ask for help. They don't think like that in terms of self-care because the survival mission is to be alert to the status, the emotional status of that parent. Because it's so unpleasant when the parent starts to lose it. And no kid likes to see their parent become disorganized. Mm-hmm. Logically, it's very, very scary. So they learn to, you know, to put that parent first. And then they learn that in order to be a good person, they have to be self sacrifice Hey, therapists, do you use EMDR in your practice? Well, then you need to know about bilateralstimulation.io. Bilateralstimulation.io is a free and simple tool to provide bilateral stimulation to your EMDR clients. Used by more than 10,000 EMDR therapists worldwide during both telehealth and in-person EMDR sessions, bilateralstimulation.io provides visual and auditory BLS, and they have remote tactile buzzers you can use to provide tactile BLS over the internet. Yannick, their creator, was an EMDR client himself, and he built bilateralstimulation.io for his own therapist at the beginning of COVID. Now it's used by more than 10,000 EMDR therapists to provide visual, auditory, and tactile BLS to their clients no matter where they are. The basic version of their BLS tool is free, and for therapy chat listeners, bilateralstimulation.io offers an extended two-month trial of their paid version, as well as a special discount on their remote tactile BLS buzzers. Visit bls.software to learn more and claim your benefits by simply typing bls.software into your browser's address bar and hitting enter. I see. There's an equation made of it. And then they learn that to be a good person means that I don't set boundaries and limits because that's being selfish. And good people would think about what other people need. And then we're not even going to go into the religious component of that. Mm. 
it's very psychologically unhealthy in the long run to live by that kind of parameter for what makes you a good person and sets you up for being exploited by emotionally immature people who really see it that way, that you really should be self-sacrificing, that you really do owe them that kind of attentiveness. Mm -hmm. So it really is a, that's part of why I wanted to get that, this recent book out there, because I want people to get the idea that they have been kind of brainwashed out of their own emotional self-protection and out of their instincts for their own self-care. You know, like people can tell inside at a feeling level if something is not right for them. I mean, we get a feeling of dread, we get a feeling of apprehension, we get anxiety, uh, we get joy, we get interest, we get curiosity. All these things move us toward and away from things that are good or bad for us. But that system gets monkeyed with by the emotionally immature parent who keeps sticking their finger into that and saying, wait a minute, you're supposed to be thinking about me and why didn't you do this and why weren't you, you know. And so the person becomes disconnected from those I guess, self-knowledge and self-achievement that would guide them towards self-care. And sometimes it takes an illness or a psychological symptom before they realize that, you know, they've gone too far and they, they're way out there on the gangplank <laughs> and needing some way to find their way back to taking care of themselves. So in this, in this most recent book, it's a collection of 76, I call them insight pieces because they're just like these little bits. They're like, you think of it like a, a book that's like tapas or hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> it's not a, a, you know, a scholarly academic book. It's, it's little vignettes that try to give a little piece of wisdom about something that has to do with either emotional self-care and protection, dealing with relationships, or coping with life's challenges. And I made it in that format because I wanted people to be able to pick it up, you know, before they go to sleep at night or, uh, you know, sit out on the back porch and read a couple of little chapters or like two, three at most pages. So they're very short, but they have a little reminder in them not to forget about yourself or to handle things in ways that support you as opposed to always being worried about what someone else thinks. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I hope people will get out of the book. Running a group private practice has been a challenging and rewarding experience. And one thing that has made it so much easier is Therapy Notes. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. If you're coming from another EHR, like I did, Therapy Notes makes the transition incredibly easy, importing your demographic data free of charge so you can get going right away. My team has found Therapy Notes very easy to learn. It's intuitive. The customer support is second to none. And that's one of the things that has kept me a Therapy Notes customer for several years now. Anytime I've needed to contact Therapy Notes for help with an issue I couldn't figure out on my own, I've been able to get through to someone and resolve the issue within 15 minutes, 99% of the time. Find out what more than 100,000 mental health professionals already know. Try Therapy Notes for two months absolutely free. Just click on the link in the show notes or enter the promo code chat at therapynotes.com. Yeah, it sounds perfect the way you've organized it because for people who are struggling with self-care, you know, a, a 15 to 20 page chapter feels a lot more daunting than just being able to pick it up and look at it when you're in the bathroom or, you know, <laughs> when you have five minutes and, you know, you can actually get something meaty from that time. Yeah, that that was uh, definitely the hope for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so. Can you talk about what some of the ways are that your book helps people with, you know, what are like some of the things it describes that people can do to improve their relationship to their self-care needs? Uh -huh. Yeah, like in the first section, the protecting and caring for yourself, talk about being true to yourself and how to do that. And one of the ways is that you have to remember that 
you're a real person who is unique from everybody else. And that needs to be discovered and supported and celebrated. And it needs to be put into words. You build a better relationship with yourself when you're, when you're able to define your self-concept with accurate words and that you begin to look at what feels good and bad, like I mentioned before, so that you can even get the signal that you need to protect yourself because adult children of of these parents often have been trained out of that. And as an example of things to do, I really encourage people to be proud of themselves and to spend time on that experience. And people are often very reluctant to be a self-enthusiast because they feel like they're being, you know, self-centered or grandiose or conceited or whatever. All things that an emotionally immature parent might call the child. Mm -hmm. But we have joy about being ourselves. That's, I mean, when you're in yourself, when you're in your element, you feel joy because you you have a reunion with your with your true nature, and that comes out as this positive energy. So when you take time to be proud of yourself, that is something that helps you to define your self concept. And it also is you saying, I'm going to claim this moment of feeling good about myself for these reasons. And when you do that, you are mirroring and reflecting your best qualities so that you can have a sense of love for yourself and a sense of definition about who you are and what you're about. And that's not something that emotionally immature parents tend to be very helpful with, with their their kids. In fact, uh, I have a one of the chapters is, or one of the little pieces is a case of mistaken identity. And that's when you've been led to believe you have a certain identity in the family that just isn't true. And you feel bad when you're not in that identity, even though it doesn't fit you. Hmm. I had a, a a woman that I worked with once who she was probably, I think she might have been in her early 70s, but she finally pieced it together after uh, we had done quite a bit of therapy together, but she pieced together that she was intellectually gifted. She had not lived her life like that. She did not find herself that way, but evidence was accruing <laughs> that she was very intelligent. And when she got to this point in therapy where she was really looking at herself, she was able to see the evidence of her intellect. And it was like, it was like a a complete aha moment when she realized that she wasn't just the one of the kids. She was really a gifted child. And that has shown up in spots all through her life. But Because her parents had never identified her that way, she wasn't able to actualize that. So you have to think about how you might be different from your family's view of yourself. And you have to be very careful about what kind of criticism, you know, mockery or ridicule that you're going to be taking in from them because it can be so inaccurate. And that's one of the benefits of therapy, as you know is being able to reflect back to a person what their true strengths are. Yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh, I'm thinking just how powerful the way that roles that we are assigned in our family and the labels that are placed on us sometimes before we're even consciously aware Mm -hmm. can become how we see ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was thinking, because I did another interview right before this about talking with someone about boundary setting and Just thinking about how like parents, they're projecting their own stuff on the kids, obviously, and have these like expectations. And, and, you know, there's, I'm sure you've seen so many people who, you know, they go through school pursuing the things that their parents are interested in, and then they get a career that is what their parents want them to do. And, and you see it more now, people saying, well, I did this, but this isn't what I want. I'm I feel like there's more people now kind of saying, I'm going to do something different. I I have other options, but 
you know, it's so, I don't know, persuasive is the word that's coming to mind, like what the parents want Mm -hmm. and are sort of telling the child that the child wants becomes what the child thinks they want. And then they're like, well, I don't really know what I want, but why am I not happy? I know I've always wanted to be a doctor. I've always said I wanted to be a doctor. Why am I not happy with this? Right. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, if I could do anything for the people that come to see me for therapy, it would be to get them to honor their inner world. Mm. One of the chapters in the previous book was that the emotionally mature parent was hostile toward the child's inner world. And it was funny because the editor said, uh, Lindsay, could you find another word for that? Did you, you mean like they don't appreciate the inner world or and I said, no, that's the word they're hostile towards, <laughs> you know, ridicule, mockery. Yes. Leading the child to mistrust that inner world. And so in the book, I talk about the importance of picking your inner voice that you're going to listen to how your emotions are there to guide you toward what is going to help you to thrive and uh, flourish. It's, you know, they're not just useless firings. Um, They really are trying to get you to the environments that will allow you to grow. And you can only sense that through your inner world, through attuning to your body and Oh, how you how you feel inside. So it's it's very very important that 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 interior of a person is honored and listened to because that's what tells you I don't enjoy being a doctor. Yeah, <laughs> it might say, "Do you want to do this other thing? I really love it," but that's all coming from the inside. And it all, you know, what you want to do in therapy or in self-help is you want to learn to treat yourself with interest. You want to be interested in why I had that reaction or what does it mean that I'm not enjoying this job? Yeah. Or what does it mean that I don't feel like I can say what I truly want to say with this person? Mm -hmm. What does it mean that I'm not really comfortable in this situation? You know, that kind of curiosity and interest in the self is, you know, where you get back to finding out how you want your life to be. I love this. <laughs> we recognize it, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we hear about it and when we hear about it, we recognize it. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about this is that we don't lose that that receptivity to the truth about, you know, feeling alive or or being in your in your authentic self. We, we, thank goodness, we, we retain that always. We can tell when we're, when we're allowed to do that. Mm. It does feel good. Yeah. Yeah. And this is like, you know, it's, I mean, this is always the case for me on doing these interviews. It's, it's so thought provoking because it's, you know, you're just, of course, multiple clients are coming to mind and people I know and people in my own life and relationships who you know, times of where some of these things you're talking about apply to myself and some of them apply to these other people that I know. And um, it's just, I'm like, I'm really excited to go and read all of this. <laughs> Can you, or do you in the book talk about how to like hear that inner world and how to connect with it for people who don't who've had that experience where, you know, they, they shut off from that. It's still in there, but they don't know how to access it. Yeah. So one, one thing that's, that's important is the sense of emotional safety. When we are around people or situations that make us feel emotionally safe, there's a particular kind of calm and comfort that comes from emotional safety. But how are you going to know if there is, if it's an emotionally safe situation, if you can't pay attention to what goes on inside you? Right. You know, I I defy you to figure that out without paying attention to whether your stomach's in or not, or whether your heart's beating fast, or whether your palms are sweating, or whether you're scared. You know, all these, we, we are equipped 
through our emotions to know when something makes us feel bad. But what often happens is that we don't, we don't feel like we have the right to assess that in other people. And, and that's in, in the section about dealing with difficult people. Lots of times we feel bad about, you know, saying something about someone who hurt us and we'll say, well, yes, she did that, but she's really a nice person. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, uh, no, she's not. <laughs> it wasn't nice what she did, was it? No, he did. You know, and, and I sometimes uh, tell people, I said, well, you know, if you had a, you know, had known somebody for a long time and, and then, you know, they, they shot you in the foot. Does all that time that they were nice, does, does that fix the fact that they hurt you? You know, it's like you can't wipe out your experience. And that's good. That's, that's instinct, you know? Like we learned from it that this could happen. That's all we have to know. This person yeah. could do something like that. That's all we have to know. And yet people feel guilty for making a judgment about keeping up a boundary against someone who has been mean to them or has given them the cold shoulder or isn't, you know, isn't kind. They feel bad about that. And I, uh, one of this, the insight pieces um, is about relationship wolves using the story of Little Red Riding Hood. And it's like a lot of emotionally immature people present themselves as victims and helpless. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's Granny in the nightcap who actually turns out to be the wolf. But Little Red Riding Hood is coming closer and closer, you know, marveling at how she doesn't look like Granny. But she's not been, I know a lot about Little Red Riding Hood's family. <laughs> This is this explains what happened there. Explains it, yes, because she's staring at a wolf, and she's willing herself to not know it. Mm -hmm. But then she's she can't resist commenting on you know those big ears and those long teeth and you know yeah. But I I want to try to help people to see that these things that they do that are self protective that protect them against other people who would exploit them or hurt them, that that is healthy. Uh, you have every right to protect yourself and to set your own boundaries. But emotionally immature people will make you feel you know, guilty or ashamed or afraid or self-doubting uh, when you try to take care of yourself. And that's why it's important to, uh, you know, I think read little things like this because it starts another way of thinking starts to get in your mind and that counteracts the brainwashing from the people who wanted you to be a certain way for their good, for their mm -hmm. advantage. Yeah. Well, this is so, so helpful. And just the specific way that you explain what you're talking about is so helpful and clear. And I really appreciate it. It's just, it's very resonant. Good. I'm, yeah, I'm glad to hear it. I It's a topic that I'm endlessly fascinated by. And there's a section in um, in the book about uh, how it feels to be treated well. And that's important because you also, in addition to knowing what you want to move away from, you want to know what you want to be moving toward. And people who treat us well give us certain kinds of feelings. So I, I describe that with um, uh, different uh, people who are um, leaders or could be in different roles in your life, but they will have a certain way of making you feel that lets you know that you're being treated well. And this is an area for these adult children that's often, like I said before, very confused mm -hmm. because they're maybe they're not being treated well, but they can't put their finger on it because their mind has gotten muddied up with, oh, but she's such a sweet person or um, she didn't mean to or these kinds of rationalizations and um you know, attempts to make everything okay. Mm -hmm. And that's something that they learn to do with parents who, yeah, lots of times weren't very nice to them. Yes. Well, and that's a thing that I think when you use that example of Little Red Riding Hood, you know, she's looking at a wolf and she's trying to tell, she's using mental gymnastics to figure out why is this grandma and not what it looks like, which is a wolf. 
And, you know, I think the, the other side of that is when people are so in terms of relationships, when people have had relationships with people who have harmed them and they can't identify the, the real harm that took place as being real, mm-hmm. then the same way I think people and I see this so much, so much. They may get into a relationship with someone else and the person is truly very kind to them and they don't believe it is real and they don't, they're like, how can I know if this is just going to be like that before? You know, even though as the therapist, oftentimes when you're hearing them talk about that relationship and you've already heard them talk about those other relationships, you're like, this is clearly very different. But, you know, for the person, it's, it's deeply confusing because it's like, you know, anyone could be secretly unsafe mm-hmm. because the people who I do call and think of as being safe when they weren't, I couldn't take that in. So how can I really discern? Yeah. And uh, and if and, and if I did say, gee, you look like a wolf, I was talked out of that or I was made to feel bad about myself for being so unkind as to see her as a wolf. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, this, and the self-doubt that that stirs up along with the guilt and the shame and the rest of it. Yeah, it's really staggering what it does to a person's ability to, you know, have healthy instincts. Yes, trust their own instincts. Yeah. But I'm just, as you were saying that, if they actually said, well, why do you look like a wolf? Then the other person should say, oh, I'm wearing a wolf costume right now. That's all. You know, it should be like that it was okay to say that and they don't talk you out of it. You know, like that, maybe that's a way that it would be, you know, a clue that, you know, because the the gaslighting and the manipulation, those are red flags. But problem with manipulation, people who are good at it, you don't you don't know what they're doing it. Right. Exactly. Yes. Unless you have a concept. And if you have a concept that you can put someone's behavior in, you can observe it. And even if you have gotten unhooked from your instinct, your your inner guidance on that. If you have the concept, you can start looking for that inner guidance again or asking yourself, how do I feel around that person? Do I look forward to being with them? You know, you start to ask those kinds of questions when you can get reconnect, you know, reconnected uh, through a concept that you now have that, you know, not all grannies are nice. Yeah. Yeah. And not all grannies in bed are helpless and... <laughs> you know, uh, not a threat. (laughs) Yeah. And if I see wolf ears and wolf teeth, that is what a wolf looks like. (laughs) Yeah. And and I don't have to stick around to, you know, have a conversation. (laughs) Look closer inside their mouth to find out if it's really, yeah. Wow. This has been so, so interesting, fascinating, thought provoking. And I feel like I'm thinking about some of these ideas differently after talking with you. So thank you again for, you know, your willingness to explain this and to come on the show. Before we finish up for today, can you because I didn't say it before. Can you tell the audience what about the other books that you have too? This is your newest one. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The first book I wrote is called Who You Were Meant to Be. And these are all available on Amazon or other um, bookstores. They can be ordered. The last three are probably on the shelf in Barnes and Noble, that kind of brick and mortar store, but they certainly are all available on Amazon. So who you're meant to be is about figuring out who you're meant to be. <laughs> um, but it it also gets at this thing about how family loyalty and and that kind of confusion that happens as a result of uh, excessive loyalty and guilt keeps us from finding out what we really want to be doing with our lives. And then the next book was The Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents. And that was the one that really seem to strike a chord with readers. That was the one that lays out the concept of the emotionally immature parent. So that was sort of like the original classic one. And then the next one was recovering from emotionally immature parents. And that one has a lot more practical tips and kind of more coaching about how to handle them 
but it also has some other insights in it, other concepts about the dynamics between the, those parents and their adult children that supplements the first book. So that it's not a repeat. It's, I mean, I'm always thinking so <laughs> yeah. yeah, new stuff in that one. And then this most recent one, like I say, is, is a completely different format of, of these little insight pieces that are, you know, kind of chunky and hopefully delicious. Um, <laughs> Based on this conversation, I'm, I think that they are. Good. <laughs> Good. So do you want to tell people where they can find, keep up with the things that you're doing? I know the books are on Amazon and, and bookstores, but maybe your website. Yeah. Um, if people want to find out more about what I do, my website is Dr. Lindsay with an A Gibson.com. So it's Dr. B R L I N D S A Y G I B S O N dot com. Dr. Lindsay Gibson. Got it. And I will put a link to that in the show notes too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then if, if they want to contact me any further, you can find me online. Just look me up one line. Okay. Wonderful. And you do therapy in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Do you, are you, do you take new clients now or do you have like an established caseload? You're just. Yeah. My schedule right now is, is very, very full. I've moved to a short-term model. I do a uh, short-term therapy and coaching and I work with people all over the country. Nice. But I tend to stay pretty full. It's just a sort of a, you know, lack of the draw as to whether or not I have opening. Okay. But you are still practicing and you're still doing therapy now. So if people are interested in working with you, they can at least try if they want to. Yeah. That's good. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Lindsay, for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Oh, thank you. And and I, I just realized that I should mention, Laura, that I also do therapist training uh, uh. or um, PESI, the P-E-S-I training giant. And I do those pretty regularly. So if you go to the PESI site, if you were a therapist and you wanted to get trained in the method or the approach that I use, those are regularly available and there are recordings that are available in their therapist store. That was great. great. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I know that probably many people who are listening are like, how do I learn how to do that? <laughs> so that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Again, that, there's one coming up on November 4th. So that's, that's the next one. Oh, awesome. Awesome. That will be after this comes out, but we can go on PESI and find yeah. whatever's current. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But thank you so much for having me, Laura. It's been really a pleasure talking with you. For me too. Thank you again. Thank you to Therapy Notes for sponsoring this week's episode. I do love Therapy Notes. It's such an asset to my business and makes my job as a practice owner and a therapist much easier. Try it today with no strings attached and see why everyone is switching to Therapy Notes, now featuring ePrescribe. Use coupon code CHAT or click the link in the show notes to get two free months at therapynotes.com. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.